It is my pleasure uh, to introduce to you this morning Dr. David Ledbetter, who's the Executive Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer at Geisinger Health System, a large non-for-profit integrated health system in Danville, Pennsylvania. Dr. Ledbetter actually was recently at Emory University, where he was the Robert Woodruff Professor and Director of the Division of Medical Genetics in the Department of Human Genetics. Dr. Ledbetter has focused his research efforts on discovering the underlying etiology of childhood developmental disabilities, such as autism, and the translation of new genomics technologies into clinically useful genetic tasks for early diagnosis and intervention. His current research interest includes leveraging the massive amount of genomics data generated during routine patient care for knowledge generation and integration of this information into electronic health records in a clinically useful manner. I just want to refer you to the mobile app uh, for details of his expertise in this important field of genome science and data science, which we affectionately call big data. This morning, uh, Dr. Ledbetter will address harnessing big data, EHR genomics, and imaging from a longitudinal precision medicine cohort. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ledbetter. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the uh, invitation to speak today, and particularly thanks to Mark Bronstein from Georgia Tech, who uh, uh, suggested me to the program. Uh, Geisinger is working with Georgia Tech to develop some significant new research collaborations around health IT, including genomics information. <clears throat> I'll start with a uh, disclosure. I am a consultant to a genetics diagnostic company, Natera, uh, which is particularly interested in non-invasive prenatal diagnosis. I'm not going to discuss any of the products or services of this company today. So <clears throat> where is Geisinger? So it's a healthcare system in Pennsylvania. I love this particular map. The darker blue is our primary catchment area. And our uh, headquarters are in a small town of Danville, Pennsylvania, which has about 5,000 people. Every time I show this map, I'm reminded of James Carville, the political commentator's famous description of Pennsylvania, that is Philadelphia to the east. Pittsburgh to the west with Alabama in the middle. So we serve the entire Alabama portion of Pennsylvania, which is largely a small town and rural uh, population. <clears throat> We're an integrated healthcare system, which means we have uh, providers, employed physicians, and other healthcare providers. In total, we're now about a $7 billion a year operating company. So these are the financial representation of uh, Geisinger. Uh, we employ, uh, th these are our uh, hospital facilities shown in the left column. It's about eight hospitals now with the most recent acquisition of Atlanta Care, a hospital system in Atlantic City, New Jersey. So we now operate in Pennsylvania and in New Jersey. Employed physicians and other providers and an insurance company uh, as well. So it's this combination of provider and payer uh, that uh, comprises the term as an integrated healthcare system. Uh, this is a simplified diagram of this integrated healthcare system. The CEO, until very recently, Glenn Steele, uh, for 15 years, uh, recruited me to Geisinger five years ago from Emory University. I had worked for Glenn when he was dean of the medical school at University of Chicago. And when he called me in one day and announced that he was leaving the University of Chicago after spending most of his career at Harvard and said, I'm going to Geisinger. I, like many of you, said, what is that? And where is that? And you got to explain to me your uh, uh, career trajectory uh, plans from Harvard to University of Chicago to Geisinger in central Pennsylvania. He tried to explain to me what an integrated healthcare system was and what the potential opportunities 
for doing innovation and re-engineering uh, in a healthcare setting. I thought he had lost his mind, so I left Chicago and came to Emory, where I had good colleagues in the genetics department in the medical school. And he called me up one day after he had settled in at Geisinger and said, David, you have to come see this place. This is as close to Iceland as you'll find in the United States. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar, the most successful genetics research group, one of the most successful groups over the last 15 years has been the company Decode Genetics uh, in Reykjavik, Iceland. And there are a number of reasons it's been successful, and that is a very high quality national health system, a single national health database, and then a genetics company that got permission from the government to access that database and then to recruit and sequence the DNA of all of the, the entire population of Iceland. So in central Pennsylvania, there are a number of features that are similar to Iceland in that we have a stable population. That doesn't mean emotionally stable. That means they don't move very often, meaning we have grandparents, parents, and children. So we have three generation families for genetics research that's huge, hugely advantageous. Our total catchment area is uh, almost 3 million people with over 700,000 active patients and as I said, many three generation families. There's a very close and trusting relationship between the community and our patients in Geisinger. Geisinger just celebrated its 100 year anniversary, uh, centennial this year. We're the biggest employer uh, in that entire region of Pennsylvania. Uh, so many people work at Geisinger or have family members who do, and we're the predominant healthcare system uh, in the region. I've referred to our integrated system. Long-standing electronic health record, we were EPIC, which is the largest, most dominant uh, uh, electronic medical record. Uh, in the United States. We were Epic's second or third customer, depending on the story you believe, in 1996. So we have almost 20 years of longitudinal EHR clinical data. Uh, we had until very recently a, um, an academic research-oriented physician scientist CEO. Uh, uh, Glenn Steele just stepped down a few months ago and started a biobank in 2007. So I modified the previous slide to show Glenn Steele not as the president and CEO of Geisinger, but the PI of the Geisinger Healthcare Laboratory. He made a lot of our board members nervous and a lot of our physicians nervous because he referred to Geisinger frequently, not as a health system, but as his laboratory to do experiments in re-engineering healthcare in order to improve patient outcomes and thus reduce the total cost of care. So we're committed to the notion that if you keep people healthy, keep them out of the hospital, keep them out of the emergency room, you save uh, healthcare dollars uh, on the insurance side. And as an uh, integrated system with provider and payer, uh, if we reduce hospitalizations, the insurance company makes more money and we can re redistribute those profits so we can have common incentives for all of the provider and payers towards keeping people out of the hospital and keeping them healthy. So some of the other uh, important features of Geisinger is the, in addition to the electronic medical record, there's a near real-time system-wide data warehouse that includes EHR data, but also includes financial data, operational data, claims data from the insurance company. So one of the most comprehensive aggregates of health-related data on a population anywhere in the world. Uh, this data has all been cleansed, normalized, and stored in a research accessible. It was originally set up for operational purposes and for quality metrics, but as a byproduct to that became an incredibly valuable research uh, database. <clears throat> In 2010, at the time I decided to move to Geisinger, their board of directors approved a 10-year research strategic vision that included an emphasis on personalized health care. You'll hear the term precision medicine today from the Obama administration and the federal government. 
uh, quite similar ideas with an emphasis on genomics, uh, <coughs> coupled with this integrated and innovative healthcare system. Um, <coughs> So this was approved in 2009, uh, implemented in 2010. This is my personal vision statement and the reason I left Emory in order to join Geisinger, given the data resources available and the notion that whole genome sequencing was gonna become cheaper and cheaper and would become a routine part of healthcare in the not too distant future. So this vision says universal genome sequencing will become a routine part of public health and medicine in the not too distant future. So I'll hedge my bets here on the timeline. Beginning at birth, so ideally at newborn screening, because we already acquire a newborn dried blood spot on essentially every baby born in the United States. Today, we just do genetic testing for about 30 rare genetic diseases that can be lethal if not treated early. So we have plenty of DNA on every baby born and we don't take advantage of that. So that would be plenty to uh, sequence the entire genome of every individual to improve individual health and well-being while maintaining or reducing the total cost of healthcare over the lifespan. <clears throat> to do this, however, we need more data in terms of the clinical utility and value of genomic information for all the primary stakeholders. This includes patients, providers, payers, and employers. And uh, I think you'll see a trend now of this becoming, particularly starting in areas like Silicon Valley, where there's a lot of competition for the latest employee benefits. Uh, so come join our company and we'll pay to sequence your genome and you'll have your own uh, genome sequence available to inform your life and inform your health. <clears throat> and work to align incentives and payments among these stakeholders to maximize access and benefit. So what's the status of sequencing today? Well, just last fall, uh, so almost a year ago, there were two major publications in the Journal of the American Medical Association, or JAMA, from a group at Baylor and a group at UCLA using uh, whole exome sequencing. So that's not sequencing all of the genome, Sequencing all of the genes, still a little bit cheaper than sequencing all the area in between the genes. But both studies found in children with undiagnosed developmental disabilities or congenital anomalies, uh, there was this single genetic test provided a 25% diagnostic yield. So you solved the question of why the child had these developmental problems, and then in a subset of those, it gave clues as to the most appropriate intervention and treatment. So this exome sequencing is now being adopted. It's now starting to be reimbursed by insurance companies. Uh, so the sequencing I'm gonna tell you about today that we're doing at Geisinger is still on a research basis paid by research funds, but we're also starting to order exome sequencing on our patients uh, that our insurance and other insurance companies are funding. Uh, you, any one of you could get your whole genome sequenced by a company called Illumina for $5,000. To do this, your primary care physician has to order the sequencing test, and the report goes back to your primary care physician. So my wife and I did this uh, a little over a year ago, and these are my statistics. So all humans have about four million genomic variants that are different from each other human and the average human uh, genome sequence. <clears throat> and that comprises about 10 gigabytes of data. For an extra $500, you can get your entire genome sequence, the raw data, on a hard drive. That's 150 gigabytes of data. Um, and you can see the number of single nucleotide or single letter variants, three and a half million, and then larger deletions and uh, insertions. There's also a very nice clinical report that reports on <coughs> uh, genes where we know what phenotype or disease uh, the variants are associated with. So in my report, I had 6,000 variants in these genes. Fortunately, no pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants, so pretty boring uh, clinical report. 
Uh, all of us are carriers for so-called autosomal recessive genetic diseases where it requires two mutations, one from the mother, one from the father, for diseases like cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia. Uh, every uh, human has an estimated four, five, six. Uh, I had four, uh, heterozygous or single copy one for the cystic fibrosis gene, which is a quite common uh, heterozygous mutation carrier status. And then uh, they provide a, a fairly comprehensive pharmacogenomics report, which tells you your individual response to different classes of drugs and whether you're a rapid metabolizer, so you need a higher dose of the drug, you're a slow metabolizer, so you need a lower dose of the drug and may have an adverse reaction at an average dose of the drug. There's a great uh, pilot project at the uh, University of Maryland Medical School where every first year medical student gets a pharmacogenomics test done on themselves. So then throughout their four years of medical school training, later residency, every time there's a discussion about different drugs, they know their individual metabolic rate for that drug, fast, slow, or average metabolism. Uh, this is something that we and other health systems are now trying to implement into the EHR, the electronic medical record, so in any clinical setting a physician can see that some drugs may be contraindicated, other drugs you need to adjust the dosing of the drug for the individual's response uh, to it. So let's shift into, so we have a lot of clinical data compared to mo most other health systems. I told you almost 20 years longitudinal information and we capture data from every encounter. I challenged our IT group to tell me, well, how big is the big data in our EHR? So for each individual patient, how much data is there uh, cumulatively through the lifespan from birth uh, into the 90s? I have to say I was a little bit disappointed in the results, obviously the amount of data in an in individual's EHR increases, but it increases only to about 23 megabytes of data per person over the lifespan. I thought that wasn't so, so big or impressive. What's really gonna be cool, I think, is that when we're doing genome sequencing on every baby born in our health system, now we'll start life with 150 gigabytes of raw data, we can boil that down and only store 10 gigabytes of the variance. Those are the differences between each individual and the average human genome. So that's the, what will be the clinically relevant. Probably that can be compressed down to even smaller amounts, but compare 10 gigabytes of genome sequence data to 23 megabytes of clinical data. Now this excludes imaging data, which of course is very big files and sits at the moment in a separate database, although all of this is moving rapidly into a cloud environment. Uh, in our sequencing project, I'll talk about in a minute, it all sits on the Amazon cl cloud hosted by a company called DNA Nexus. Uh, and even our IT and security people are getting comfortable with the notion of having health information stored in a cloud environment with appropriate security measures. But my interest now is that in every clinical encounter throughout lifespan, we can now correlate the clinical uh, status, health status of an individual back to their individual genomic profile. And that will be accumulating genotype, phenotype correlations to then allow us to predict which individuals are at higher risk or lower risk of certain cancers or cardiovascular diseases, other common diseases. So as I said, we started our biobank in 2007 at Geisinger, it's branded as MyCode. Uh, <clears throat> we've now recruited over 90,000 individuals throughout our healthcare system from both primary care clinics and from specialty clinics, that's well over 10% of our entire population has now consented. The consent rate when we approach people in any clinic at Geisinger and ask them to participate in research and genomics research is 90%, which is unheard of in most urban setting and reflects this not, uh, close trusting relationship between our patient population and their physicians and their health system. 
Uh, since I've been there five years, I've been doing a lot of recruiting uh, to create a genomic medicine implementation team. Initially, I did this because I knew that uh, NIH, which has always been the major funder for biomedical research in the U.S., and particularly for the Human Genome Project, uh, I thought they would come out with uh, grant opportunities uh, for genome sequencing of large cohorts that had comprehensive clinical data. That hasn't happened yet. We'll come back to that at the end. But I started recruiting physician genetics experts, genetic counselors, uh, laboratory geneticists, bioethicists, and biomedical informatics people. I stole a couple of my uh, Emory colleagues, Krista Martin and Andy Fawcett, uh, and recruited other great geneticists from around the uh, United States. We are currently funded in a number of uh, NIH important uh, collaborative projects, one of which is called eMERGE, or Electronic Medical Records and Genomic Information. It's a collaboration between uh, nine different health systems and academic medical centers around the United States, including Vanderbilt, uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, <coughs> um, Group Health in Seattle, uh, and a number of other organizations. And because to do, uh, get the most power in genetic studies, you need very large cohorts. These institutions have agreed to share electronic health data across the nine collaborating institutions and generate genetics information and share that. It's been a very powerful uh, genetics discovery tool to share health data and genomics data across such a large health network. We're also involved in something called the Clinical Genome Research, Resource, abbreviated ClinGen, which is a se series of three different uh, NIH grants, and Geisinger is funded by two of those grants, along with our colleagues at Harvard, UCSF, uh, Baylor in Houston, University of North Carolina, Stanford, uh, and others. Um, a description of this resource was published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine. The problem that we're addressing is this, it may not be that easy to see, but this is a distribution of the number of times particular genomic variants have been seen in a clinical molecular genetics diagnostic lab or clinical sequencing lab. And this is the variant has been seen one time. That means this is the first time that particular variant has ever been seen. So the majority when we're doing molecular diagnostics and you find a change that suggests a potential pathogenic effect in a gene, nobody's ever seen it before. So you're trying to interpret it without uh, any empiric evidence-based data. Uh, a few, have been see few more have been seen two times, three times, etc. Only 17% have ever been seen 10 times or more, uh, and fully 80% have only been seen one or a handful of times. So we need much more data to help us interpret the clinical health implications of genomic variants. The only way to do that is to aggregate data across many, many uh, health systems, and then have an expert curation process to determine which variants uh, are the pathogenic disease-causing variations uh, in the genome. So <clears throat> for this, we have involvement of patients, clinicians, laboratories, and researchers, all collating data to build this evidence base in a central uh, ClinGen database that will become the knowledge base uh, for the clinical um, significance, clinical meaning of all genomic variants uh, over time. So this is trying to take uh, each genomic variant from a status of no evidence uh, to a single lab has observed it, to multiple labs have seen it, to it's been reviewed by an expert panel and finally reaches a, a high enough evidence level that it can be actually put into pra professional practice guidelines so that all clinicians uh, and patients are able to refer to this uh, sort of gold standard of, the standard of the clinical utility of these variants. This is hard to read from here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> 
So again, the goals of this project are to produce this definitive, central, and hopefully easy to use reference for clinicians and patients to identify evidence-based information on the clinical significance of this large number of genomic variants. Uh, we included in the publication and on our website a Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame means these are the genetics testing labs that have been willing to share their patients' data into a public database in order to uh, accelerate our knowledge and ability to interpret genomic variants. Um, and I'll just uh, point out happily that uh, Emory University is one of the, the medical school and genetics department is one of the largest contributors uh, to this database. Um, in putting together a large genomic medicine team, there are a number of social issues, uh, ethical issues, legal issues. So we've built a strong bioethics team uh, at Geisinger uh, and also an external independent ethics advisory committee led by Kevin Fitzgerald, uh, a Jesuit priest and PhD in molecular biology at Georgetown University, along with other genetics and uh, ethics experts around the country. Uh, we also have a community, community representation in this advisory committee as well. So while we were waiting for NIH to come out with requests for grant applications to sequence large cohorts of patients with comprehensive clinical data, we were approached by a pharmaceutical company, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals in Terrytown, New York. Um, <clears throat> and signed an agreement with them in January of 2014, so approaching two years. Uh, there was a press release on the day of our uh, official signing in the New York Times. Uh, this is some of the information from the press release. George Yankopoulos, one of the co-founders of Regeneron uh, and an outstanding uh, scientist in his own right. Um, our original goal in this collaboration was 100,000 Geisinger patients. We quickly got so far ahead of that schedule, we expanded it to at least 250,000 patients. Uh, I think modeling our patient population, we could probably recruit 500,000 patients in the Geisinger system. Uh, Les Biesecker from the NIH Genome uh, Center was interviewed in that New York Times article and described it as the largest clinical sequence, sequencing undertaking in this country uh, by a long shot. So this is our MyCode Biobank enrollment. As I mentioned earlier, over 90,000 will reach 100,000 probably in January. We're now recruiting over 1,000 patients a week throughout our healthcare system. 50,000 of those participants have, uh, we've completed their exome sequencing. Uh, Regeneron is now sequencing over 1,500 uh, patients per week, so we're struggling to hire enough consenters and recruiters to keep up with their sequencing uh, operation in Terrytown. Some of the uh, important descriptors and elements of our cohort, again, over 90,000. Uh, the median years of longitudinal clinical data from the EHR is now 12 years. So our EHR goes back almost 20 years, but the average patient in our biobank and sequencing project with 47 clinical encounters in that time frame, over 450 lab tests, over 94 vital measures, and about a third of these uh, have insurance claims data in addition to clinical data. So we can compare our precision medicine or precision health biobank and genomics uh, project to others. To do this, we have to go to other countries. So the UK is a little bit bigger at 500,000 individuals. Iceland, I alluded to earlier, they only have 280,000 people in the country. They've collected in their biobank over half of those. And the country of Estonia has an ambitious goal of collecting into their biobank uh, a million people, which is almost the entire population of Estonia. Uh, but if you go down the list of the features, uh, and I'll show this in more detail on the next slide, 
Uh, Geisinger is unique in the nature of its consent, which is a full so-called opt-in consent. So every patient is consented uh, specifically to allow us to have access to their EHR clinical data, to obtain blood for DNA analysis up to and including whole genome sequencing. Really important to recontact the patient if we need any additional information or want to ask them to participate in other aspects of research. Um, and most unique, we have a commitment as a health system, we know that we're going to identify genomic variants that have implications for these research participants' health today or in the near future. And so we've set up our IRB, Institutional Review Board, consent process uh, that we will return any clinically relevant information back to the participants in research. And we'll do this with a genomic medicine expert team, including genomic physicians, genetic counselors, uh, with uh, other support services as well. So these are the key features, again, a full opt-in consent, broad recontact, longitudinal EHR, we got multiple samples, return of clinically actionable results, and recently we have approval to do online recruiting and online consenting, and no other U.S. or foreign biobank and genomics projects has all of these elements. So what are we going to return? We know from other people's studies that if I sequence healthy adults, like people in this room today, 2% or 1 out of 50 will find a mutation, a pathogenic mutation, in a gene that puts you at significantly increased risk of cancer or cardiovascular disease. The American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, the primary professional society for the field of medical genetics, uh, put together a committee to make recommendations. If you're sequencing the entire exome, all the genes of an individual, in any clinical setting, and you happen to find a pathogenic disease-causing mutation in another uh, unrelated gene, should you report that back? And they said, yes, it's analogous to doing a physical exam when somebody comes in for their annual physical and you find something unexpected. You tell them that you found, found something that needs follow-up attention and care. So the American College published uh, a little over a year ago the recommendations that there were 56 genes and diseases where we had enough evidence in the literature and we understand that this gene causes a significant increase in risk of particular cancers or cardiovascular disease for the most part uh, and said if you're doing clinical sequencing and you find a pathogenic mutation, you should tell the patient and counsel them appropriately. On that uh, national committee, I've indicated two of our Geisinger genetics faculty who served on the original committee, Krista Martin, who used to be at Emory, now at Geisinger, currently chairs this advisory committee uh, to update that. So since it's 2% will have one of these mutations, we did an early calculation based on our initial goal of 100,000 participants, and we knew that we would find uh, in that 2,000 individuals who had one of these pathogenic mutations. Most of these are single gene disorders, so-called dominant disorders, which means if you find it, there's a 50% chance of one of your children having it, probably one of your parents has it, and each of your close or first degree relatives is at 50% risk to have that same mutation. So the multiplier effect means we're going to identify an additional 12,000 individuals or 14,000 people out of our research study with 100,000 will be identified as being at high risk, and they may not be in a high risk family, there may not be a family history of these disorders, so this may be surprising news uh, to the research participants and their family members. Uh, this table shows the most prevalent of these conditions, so just three different conditions. Familial hypercholesterolemia, which uh, causes early onset coronary artery disease due to very high cholesterol levels, 
Uh, this is an autosomal dominant single gene disorder that's very well known and described, although the prevalence is now known to be much more common than we used to think. Fully one in uh, about 200 or one in 175 in our population. Uh, and <clears throat> I'll talk some more about that example. Hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, one in 400. This is early onset breast, ovarian, and prostate cancer due to mutation in one of two genes, the famous BRCA1 and BRCA2. Angelina Jolie had a mutation in BRCA1, had prophylactic mastectomy, uh, and helped raise attention about the need for genetic testing and screening uh, in these high-risk situations. And another high-risk colon cancer disorder, Lynch syndrome, again, one in 100, early onset uh, colon cancer. And in all of these, if we know you have a mutation that puts you at high risk, there's more intensive monitoring and screening that we can use for early detection and prevention of the onset of the cardiovascular disease or the cancer. So just these three conditions have a frequency about one in 100 in the population, one in 100 in this room, and you, we know that about half of the cases do not have a significant positive family history, so they don't know that they're at increased risk. So in uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, we've identified a pathogenic mutation in one out of every 175 patients in our biobank. This shows the distribution over three genes, including some pedigrees with high cholesterol in a number of individuals without a known diagnosis of FH. The American Academy of Pediatrics has a recommendation that if you're in one of these high-risk, high-cholesterol families, that <clears throat> statin therapy should be uh, implemented by age eight in children. So by age eight, there's already the starting to accumulate an atherosclerotic buildup that will damage the heart. So instead of waiting until these individuals are adults and have a lot of damage that cannot be reversed by statins or even by the new PCSK9 inhibitors available for these drugs, you have to start young. And so we now have this really interesting possibility in our health system to identify every family, to identify the children who carry these mutations, and to try to prevent the early initiation of cardiovascular disease and keep their heart completely healthy throughout lifespan. <clears throat> when we look into the EHR of these mutations that we identify, we find very high cholesterol in over 70% in the, in the individuals. In 10% of the cases, there's no apparent clinical abnormalities from their cholesterol uh, levels or other information, although we've not gone and contacted these people, brought them in for closer uh, medical examination and for uh, updated laboratory testing. So these are very highly penetrant genetic diseases, meaning if you have a pathogenic mutation, your risk of developing disease is very high. So our short-term and long-term goals for this are to find every patient and family member in the Geisinger Health System with familial hypercholesterolemia, determine the optimal, uh, optimum age and method of treatment with statins or the new PCSK9 inhibitors to prevent the early onset of cardiovascular disease and damage. We will also be able to find every person with BRCA1 and 2 mutation for early monitoring and detection. There's good surveillance monitoring early detection for breast cancer. Unfortunately, at the moment, there's not very good monitoring and detection of ovarian cancer. So in most cases, prophylactic removal of the ovaries is recommended uh, to avoid ovarian cancer. There's some new exciting studies sequencing peripheral blood and identifying very low frequencies of early tumor cells or cancer by sequencing peripheral blood. 
and we're planning to initiate some research studies in these BRCA carriers to screen them by sequencing and see if we can identify early signs of uh, breast or, or ovarian cancer and then uh, intervene in those cases. So precision medicine, you may have heard in uh, President Obama's State of the Union address in January uh, of this past year. Uh, his announcement tonight, I'm launching a new precision medicine initiative to bring us closer to curing diseases like cancer and diabetes, give us all access to the kind of personalized information we need to keep ourselves and our families healthier. There was a White House briefing a couple weeks after the State of the Union, uh, which I was able to attend with George Yankopoulos from Regeneron. Um, <clears throat> and here's a definition of uh, precision medicine. This project is intended to be a longitudinal cohort of a million or more Americans who have volunteered to participate. Participants will be asked to consent for extensive characterization of biological specimens, including whole genome sequence, all linked to electronic health records. Sounds kind of like what we've been doing since uh, January of 2014. So we're uh, at least a year, probably two years ahead of this national effort. We're looking forward to figuring out how to partner and uh, support that project, but uh, I'm a little bit concerned given that this will be a complex, large um, government-sponsored research program. It may take a while before this is actually launched uh, and has any major impact. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge my colleagues at Regeneron, uh, including Georgian Kopoulos uh, and others and the genomic medicine implementation team at Geisinger I alluded to earlier. And I just put this slide back so that I can show my email address if anybody has any uh, further questions. And I'm gonna stop there, and if there's time, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.